Please welcome SPU President-Elect, Dr. Herndon. Thank you. It's with great excitement that I opened the first inaugural SPU Live meeting. We have an exciting program. I'd like to thank uh, Louis Braga and Emily Johnson for their hard work. Back in March, when this SPU meeting was canceled, we were all disappointed. We did have a thought of entertaining a live Zoom meeting, but uh, at that point, we're, we're not as facile as we are now with technologies that leverage uh, virtual meetings. With that being said, we did revigorate the idea, and we've had a lot of work behind the scenes. A special thanks to Lorena Grady and Brittany Farrar that have really helped us um, organize ourselves, and hopefully this will be a well-run meeting. The thought was to have a combined pre-recorded meeting in addition to a live meeting, and this is a first. There is some risk to this, but I felt that uh, this was an opportunity, again, to leverage these new technologies as this may be where we end up in the future. I'd like to give a special thanks to Mike Ritchie, who's president, for his wisdom and friendship that I've garnered over the last year, and he'll be rotating off as the past president. In addition, uh, I am very excited for the program that we've um, developed a virtual meeting as well, and Dr. Braga will speak to that. Over the last uh, two months, we've lost one of our pioneers, leaders in the field, a friend, a brother, and Dr. Howard Snyder. And I'd like to take this opportunity to transition over to Dr. Doug Canning, who's accepted our invitation to speak about his dear friend. Doug? Uh, thank you. Thank you, Tony. Um, and thank you for the opportunity to, to talk about our friend Howard. <clears throat> we lost Howard Snyder on June the 4th. We we're all sad. We lost a patriot, a consummate surgeon, an engaged teacher who taught many of us, a clear thinking scholar, both in and out of the operating room and a family man who gave as generously at home as he did at work. We all lost a friend. Howard was born, born, Howard was born on August 25th, 1943 in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. To understand Howard properly, you need to know something about his family. Howard's father and grandfather were decorated U.S. Army generals who collectively fought in five wars. In 1916, Howard's grandfather was a young surgeon when he deployed to Mexico with General John J. Blackjack Pershing shortly after Pancho Villa attacked a small border town of Columbus in the then brand new state of New Mexico. Not long afterward, World War I broke out and Howard's grandfather was redeployed to Europe, where he was rapidly promoted through the ranks of colonel, and then in the Second World War to Major General. During World War II, as Inspector General of the Medical Corps, he was responsible for all the military house hospitals throughout the world, and he reported directly to General George C. Marshall. <clears throat> Near the end of the war, the elder Dr. Snyder wrote a blistering account of what he believed was, were poorly funded U.S. military hospitals that angered Eisenhower. Eisenhower demanded to see Dr. Snyder. They became fast friends. Despite being technically retired during the age, due to age in 1945, the elder Snyder stayed on as personal physician to Eisenhower until the end of the war. He remained President Eisenhower's personal physician throughout the Eisenhower years of presidency. He remained close to Eisenhower and his family until the president's death in 1969. This picture was one of, the, of only a few portraits that that President Eisenhower painted. And this one was of his friend, Howard's grandfather. Howard's father, also Howard McCrum Snyder, was West Point class in 1936. He was an equestrian, originally in the horse cavalry. He rapidly became interested in tank warfare and was a tank officer when he met Loane McLaughlin, Howard's mother, while assigned to Fort Benning, Georgia. Like Howard's grandfather, his father was rapidly promoted through World War II to Brigadier General by 1949. As an intelligence officer, Howard, Howard's father developed 
helped develop the strategy that freed the members of the 101st Airborne when they were cut off from the Allied troops in Bastogne during the Battle of the Bulge. <laughs> After the war, Howard had advantages that few young boys enjoy. As the son of a general officer on a military reservation and the grandson of a White House physician, Howard lived a privileged life. When the family moved to Washington in 1953, Howard would spend Saturdays at the White House pool. Howard has bounced the beach ball with British Prime Minister Anthony Eden and is one of only a few U.S. citizens who has seen a president naked. As Howard's father traveled through the military, he had Howard, <coughs> then known as Howie, ride on the top of the radio on, Sh on Sherman tanks. Howard hunted quail in Texas stream beds and fished wherever he went. This photo was taken just two or three years before Howard entered St. Andrews School. Howard excelled at St. Andrews. He loved the school and he, re and he received the Founders Medal for first in school when he graduated in 1961. Howie, as he was then known, easily gained admission to Princeton where he earned a varsity letter in shooting and raced star class sailboats on the weekends with a world champion skipper. It was around that time that he began to introduce himself more frequently as Howard. Howard's sophomore year at Princeton, however, was special for a major event that shaped his life. En route to a hospital mission in Ecuador, as his plane circled across the Andes, one engine failed and the plane lost altitude and crashed. The crew was killed instantly upon impact. All in the plane but Howard were unconscious. Howard made his way out of the plane, then re-entered it over and over to bring the passengers out and laid them on the jungle floor to recover. His mentor and trip leader succumbed to complications of a subdural hematoma. All others survived and followed Howard to a nearby village where they were rescued. And Howard likes to tell us that that's the reason, maybe the only reason, he was accepted to Harvard Medical School. Howard's surgical training was like few others in Boston. His residency in general and thoracic surgery under Franny Moore, his pediatric surgical residency under Robert Gross and Hardy Hendren, his urologic training under, under Ben Giddes and Alan Reddick was rich in volume and diversity of caseload. When Howard decided that he wanted to pursue pediatric urology, he traveled to England to spend six months each with Sir David Innes Williams at the Hospital for Sick Children at Great Ormond Street and with J. Herbert Johnson at the Alder Hay in Liverpool. After Howard finished at the Great Ormond Street, in 1980, he migrated to CHOP at the behest of C. Everett Coop and John Duckett, where he became half of one of the great collaborations in modern pediatric urology, and where he, he would spend the next 33 years. Howard's time in CHOP resulted in 375 publications in all areas of pediatric urology. At CHOP, Howard helped launch the career of 120 residents in urology, 36 North American and 12 foreign fellows and many junior staff of which I count myself. Howard influenced our current thinking in areas as diverse as the care of posterior urethral valves, prune belly, hypospadias, crypt orchidism, and management of neuropathic bladder, andrology, and pediatric urologic oncology. He led as chairman or president of virtually all of our national and local medical societies, including this one. He's been an active member of the American Association of General Urinary Surgeons, and he served on the American Board of Urology as both a member and an examiner. Howard's early life, constantly exposed to leaders and real life heroes, taught him courage and determination and a zeal for excellence that was the, that were the, that was the trademark, was his trademark throughout his career. Howard once said, and I quote him, you don't grow timid of power when you have seen the president naked. He has taken his lineage, part healer and part warrior to many venues, from the operating room and, and clinics at CHOP to numerous lecture halls, just like this one, where we have heard his pointed commentary, which was steeped in data, careful thinking, enormous clinical experience, and a strong personal conviction, and we've all benefited. As a surgeon, he was meticulous. He constantly refined the selection of each in instrument. He placed each suture with the goal to save time without sacrificing accuracy. As an advocate for his tiny patient, for his colleague, and for whatever cause he believed was right, he was relentless. As a teacher, he was known to his students as a friend, as a demanding mentor who always knew how to inspire them to get more out of themselves than even they knew possible. 
In the operating room, he was known to all for his ability to break the most complex surgery down to hundreds of steps and his ability to talk through an eight-hour case seemingly without ever stopping to breathe. His teaching did not stop at CHOP. Howard traveled to more than 140 invited lectureships and 42 visiting professorships in 19 countries on five continents. But Howard never lost his affection for England. In 2002, Howard was awarded the St. Paul's Medal, an award only occasionally presented by the, by the British Association of Urologic Surgeons to a non-British colleague for contributions to British urology. Howard's friendship with countless surgical leaders throughout North America and worldwide always made CHOP an interesting place to work. He was proud of his friendships that he'd made at meetings and, and visits across the world. Many of Howard's friends are here today. Howard's patients were committed to him. The Howard Snyder Chair at CHOP was funded by many of Howard's grateful patients and is designed to help fund the care of children who have recon been reconstructed and require a transition to adult practice. At a meeting nine years ago, when we endowed the chair, more than 150 of Howard's colleagues, former fellows, and patients came to honor him from 23 countries and six continents. Some of you were there. The Pediatric Urology Medal, awarded by the American Association of Pediatric, Pediatric Section in Urology, is the highest award that our section bestows upon a member. The medal is awarded to only a few individuals that have made outstanding contributions to our specialty. In 1984, Dr. Harry Spence was the first recipient. In the decades since, a host of other innovators, mentors, clinicians, researchers, teachers, authors, and leaders have been so recognized by their peers. In 2013, Howard was the 29th recipient. But of all Howard's accomplishments, Howard was most proud of his family. Mimi and Howard were married for 46 years. During that time, Mimi applied her considerable skills as a research trained chemist in Wharton MBA to enrich their community and Howard's family life. Mimi, who survives Howard, is known for her record on blue cooking, her gardening and painting, and her unending support for Howard, their daughter, Emily, their sons, Curtis and Jonathan, their, their son-in-law, her son-in-law, Rick, daughters-in-law, Nicole and Anne-Marie, and their 10 grandchildren. Many years ago, I asked Howard to tell us what three things for which he is most proud. He said his family, his military heritage, and his commitment to service, service to his country, to his family, to his church, and to countless numbers of trainees that he's had a chance to influence. And I think that is nearly all of us. We are all lucky to have known him. Howard, congratulations on an outstanding life. And thank you for your wisdom, your commitment, your loyalty, your courage, and your grace. We all miss you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hardin, and thank you, Dr. Kenny, for that beautiful tribute to our friend, Dr. Snyder. It is a great honor to be the chair for the first virtual SPU meeting. Our societies are going through a difficult times with this pandemic, but it's up to us to adapt and rise to the challenge. Can you all hear me? So this is what the SPU leadership under Dr. Ritchie and Dr. Hardin has done. I would like to thank specifically Dr. Mike Ritchie for trusting me with the organization of this meeting. I would also like to thank my, my co-chair, Dr. Emily Johnson for her incredible work and availability. I cannot forget to thank again those behind the scenes, the production team that helped put together this meeting and last but not the least, Lorraine O'Grady and Brittany DeFiore. Brittany, really special thanks to you for being always available and for your impeccable organization. Without your effort and dedication, this meeting would not have happened. As you all know, the SPU is comprised of lectures, panels, and abstract presentations. Due to this pandemic, we had to shorten the meeting and decided to highlight the panels and lectures today. You should not forget though, that our fellows and residents have worked very hard to put together excellent abstracts that can be viewed at the SPU website. 
please check it out. They deserve it. Before we get started, we have to a couple of housekeeping items that I have to go over with you. If you'd like to participate in the Q&A part, use the chat window on the right of your screen and click chat as a guest to get started. Thank you to our sponsors, Palette Life Science for their exhibit support and for being a gold sp sponsor of the SPU. Other exhibitors available in the digital marketplace over the course of the day are Labory, Prometheus Group, Ramsey Kut, Retrofin, and Sanford Health. You can access the digital marketplace at any time during the SPU Live by clicking on the click here to visit the digital marketplace button above the video screen. The ESPU, or sorry, the SPU is offering a maximum of 7.75 uh, AMA PRA category one credits for the SPU Live. Evaluations will be conducted through an online survey. Uh, the survey will be sent to all the attendees by the end of next week. Once completed, you'll be able to retrieve and print out your certificate of attendance. Finally, I would like to leave you with two slides I would like to leave you with two slides uh, from two famous uh, French painters. One is from Edward Manet. Concision in art is a necessity and an elegance. And I think this applies to what we're trying to do today. Content the meeting in a small, but with very important topics. The second one is from another important and very famous painter, Dr. Pierre Morican, our hypospadiologist. And then I think I'll leave it this meeting because the SPU has done a great job. Uh, we all have uh, to adapt to this pandemic. And uh, as uh, Bernard Churchill has once said, never let a good crisis go to waste. So we're trying to make the most out of it. So now I think we can get started with the first panel. And I'm very excited to um, hand it over to Dr. Patricio Gargolo, who is gonna uh, chair and moderate the next panel on bladder atrophy. Patricio, uh, the screen is yours.